let me tell you the very start of Undernauts, Labyrinth of Yomi. No. You hear singing. You wake up in what appears to be a mine cave-like area. And the singing is coming from this girl in the room just standing there. And all around you are the corpse of your comrades. Your legs are injured badly and you can't run away. Then, the girl stops singing and says to herself, I have to eat. Eat humans. Her left arm that resembles a giant leech started to slowly devour the corpse around you, one after the other, slowly making her way towards your body. But then she finally stops then says, no, Lucy is too full. I'll eat you another day. She walks out the nearby door with her footsteps trailing off in the distance. You narrowly escaped death. Undernaught is a severely unknown JRPG that was first released in late 2021. The game was developed by Experience Inc. and Poppy Works and also published by Axis Games. All of which are even living in the shadows of the other larger gaming companies around them. Just how underrated and unknown is Undernaught? It doesn't even have its own Wikipedia page. Big Rigs has its own page. I discovered Undernauts by pure happenstance as I did my usual Steam browsing. I was in that weird game funk where I really couldn't find something to satisfy what I wanted to play at the time. Undernauts was a very positively reviewed game with 92 reviews that flew under the radar of so many people. And most of the reviews were nothing but positive and great things to say about the game. The only reviews that I saw that were negative about the game was the fact that it was not worth it at the price of $60. Other than that, the game is worth it and you can find it on a good sale. I will be presenting everything I have from the Switch version of the game, which I got for like half price off, and I'm like a fiend whenever there's a sale, so I had to get it. Now, Undernauts plays very much like the Etrian Odyssey series or Shin Megami Tensei Strange Journey, meaning the game has a first-person dungeon-crawling grid system style gameplay. Most people may already knock this one off already because they may say, hey, this is not my kind of game, but I highly encourage you to try it if you are that curious about the game. Navigation is simple, and as you progress, you'll gain these flowers to help change the aspects of the labyrinth. Some examples include things like the door flowers that will help you create doorways at certain walls or the ladder flower that helps you go up and down different floors. Undernauts has a sort of horror aspect to it and from playing it, I'll just say this now, while it doesn't have an overtly horror-like experience as seen in games like Soma or Outlast with their jump scares, what Undernauts does have is something similar to the geniuses of horror games and that's atmosphere. When done correctly, atmosphere just downright makes any situation frightening. Jump scares are your nice two seconds of oh ho, <laughs> you got me. But the atmosphere is something that will just slowly eat away at somebody's mind. Like hearing something in the distance, like you know it's there, but you don't know where exactly it is or when it will finally show itself. Or one of my favorites is when you hear something in the distance and it just mysteriously disappears, going away. Never really knowing if it will come back or not. Leaving you in that space of did I just dodge something scary? Or is it just the ambience? It sets the mood for a well-executed, anxiety-inducing experience. Now, on top of wondering whether if your team is trained enough to take on the next set of challenging fights, the creepiness of the game adds even more layers of stress as you progress. Some areas of Undernauts has music that adds to the tension of exploration. But for some odd reason, because of the developer's choice, some areas just don't have music at all. And now I'm just filled with even more dread and fear than I did before. Why did I do that? I don't know. Sometimes in the distance, you can hear the sounds of a monster sound effect, and it made me worry if something was coming my way or is just there as an added effect for the background. The music of the game though is also really great as well. Whether you're exploring the scary labyrinth battling or at the base camp relaxing to the radio, it's really hard to find a track that's out of place or annoying to listen to. And yeah, I will admit the battle music does get repetitive, but that's something that really happens in most JRPG games. But dear god, one of the most spine-chilling songs I've ever heard in my life was from this game's sort of negotiation mechanic with the enemies in this game. That piano just makes me shiver every single time I hear it. It's just, ugh, no. All of this is where Undernaught excels at. This game is most definitely a JRPG at its heart, as seen with its combat, but that semi-horror aesthetic of the game really gets me on the edge of my seat, and it really gives me a sense of fear as I go through the game. The areas you explore will be dark and adds even more layers of anxiety as you explore, but thankfully things will be lit up as soon as you defeat the powerful enemy that guards the energy within the area. 
idea. But pretty much throughout the whole game, you are trapped in this scary world with no idea what you got yourself into or what the world is capable of doing. Not knowing what will happen next since you're playing by the rules of a world you're not from. Now, the battle system of this game is very simplistic, but it does feature its own unique spin to turn-based combat. Combat is a six-party system where you customize your entire party, like everything. Background, stories, sprites, stats, and class. So yes, you could have a party full of defenders or casters if you want, but you'd be crazy to do so. Undernauts features its unique switch boost mechanic, which allows you to have a turn of boosted stats and abilities. We have three special boosts to utilize, each one lasting only one turn when in use, and it has to be put on recharge mode to gain more uses again. Overcharge mode enhances your skills, making your unit stronger, and your skills can be used without expending MP for one turn. Dura charge increases your party's defense. All damage is half from the enemies, and your party is immune to status ailments. And lastly, Neuro charge. This enhances speed and luck. Accurate and invasion are increased as well. Using this will put your units first in the attack order. In addition, if a battle is won while Neuro Charge is on, you will receive more treasure drops. Use these often to breeze through battles and get extra rewards. And yes, it does feel bad if you fail to get a Neuro Charge win for the extra rewards, so you gotta time everything carefully. And this game will challenge you as you play, so if you're not a completely grind out person who's gonna one shot everything, you should utilize things like debuffs on the enemies, such as accuracy and evasion down. And on the side of exploration, this game does not have any quest direction marker, so you'll have to pay extra attention to what's going on in the dialogue, read signs on the ground, and etc. to get an idea of where to go next. This really adds to the immersion of the game while you're exploring Yomi. And for those who are curious and wondering what exactly Yomi means, well, a quick Wikipedia search tells us that Yomi is the Japanese word for the land of the dead or world of darkness. Pleasant. With the game mechanics out of the way, let's talk about what exactly is Undernauts all about. I'll do a quick rundown of what the background of the game is, so no major spoilers yet. The year is 1979, and our setting is in Tokyo Metropolis Yomi Ward. Decades ago, a mysterious large structure known as Yomi suddenly appeared out of nowhere, and it's filled with a bountiful new energy source called Argent. This caused a lot of people to flock to the city in hopes of finding their fortune. But unfortunately, Yomi's Labyrinth is filled with monsters. This is where the Undernauts come in. They're workers who venture into Yomi's Labyrinth to dispatch of threats and gather the resources inside. In recent years, mining activity has diminished, causing a number of businesses that relied upon Undernauts to steadily shut down. During this economic turmoil, a lucrative Yomi mining job was offered to the small mining firm Cassandra Co., the company that our main character is a part of. The job is to mine this new area of Yomi filled with untapped resources, and we'd be fools if we turned down this job because the payment is high. To put it in perspective, one Argent is equal to 1,000 yen, which is roughly 10 US dollars, depending on the conversion rate. Unfortunately, it's bad timing for Cassandra Co., as we have few employees on hand to perform such dangerous work as Undernauts, so we need to recruit fast, but we're limited by our size and money. So just like any good upstanding company, we decide to illegally start targeting mostly women and students for recruitment via shadowy back channels. The common notion that went around the public was that Undernaut work was only meant for the toughest and strongest of men. And because of this, other companies overlook the wider range of people who can work. To prevent anyone from seeing what we were doing, Cassandra Co. rented out candy stores to be used as a front for their illegal job interviews. Finally, we were able to gather together a talented, if inexperienced, group of people. As we stood before the gate into Yomi Labyrinth, our narrator delivers a warning to the new recruits. Disasters and death are common in the unexplored areas of the Labyrinth. If you wish to go back, this is your last chance to do so. Nobody flinched at his words. Maybe they were brave. Maybe they were desperate. Let's bring back a massive hole. We'll come back so rich, we'll be able to spend the rest of our days living in luxury. That's what we all hoped for. However... Sometime after, a radio message goes off telling us that it's been a day since all contact with District 99 base camp was lost, this being our main character's base camp. Yomi Corp, a corporation in charge of all activities in Yomi, released a partial list of trapped members. Yomi Public Corp Labyrinth Workforce Supervisors Sachiko Inoue and Chusuke Hanba. Mining Division Chief under Na Izumu Mifune. Cassandra Company President and CEO Kaori Sandra. And from the same company as Kaori, the Mining Division Chief and under Na, us, the main character. 
Right after this, we are put into the character creation, and oh my god, this song is... it's pretty good. Before I continue showing off the rest of the game, right after we make our character, we're put into the sequence where the girl is eating our dead comrades. Now, this is the time where I will tell you to step out if you are remotely interested in playing this game, because I am going to talk about the rest of the story of the game, and I highly encourage anybody who is remotely curious about this game to go pick it up and play it yourself, because the company behind this is super small, and I really want to see some more support for them. But, if you don't wish to pick up this game and want to hear what happens, happens next, then let me tell you about all the crazy things that happen in the game Undernaught's Labyrinth of Yomi. The player customization is pretty robust. You start by choosing one of four archetypes, all of which don't really matter honestly. You can change your sprite and your backstory below. You can pick your name and your nickname, and you're able to edit the notes or background story here. I left mine as default because I really didn't have an imagination at the time to conjure up a story for my main character. Now here's where the gameplay important choices come in. Your background determines your initial starting attributes which coincide with your job after. Your main attributes are strength, which affects your physical damage, con, which is your HP, int affects magic damage and mana pool. Wiz also affects mana, but instead influences healing magic instead of attack. Speed affects turn order, accuracy, and evasion. And luck is kind of like your usual mixed bag of things. It affects accuracy a bit, dodging, and even the loot gain. I usually like playing physical builds, so for my MC, I went with athlete. The job type list are your classes for the game. Tactician is this all-arounder job with a good amount of damage. Bulwark are your tanks able to defend the rest of your team with their abilities. Fighter and Fencers are your powerful offensive frontline. Hunter and Sorcerer are your strong offensive backline. Clerics are, well, what you expect, a healer. Ninjas have a bit of utility and setup, but are strong either as a frontline or back, it seems. We're also able to see all the skills associated with each job, giving you a preview of what they'll get later on. I decided to pick Tactician because it reminded me of Fire Emblem Awakening, and... I decided why not. Later on in the game, you'll be able to promote each job. You have two choices for promotion. You can either specialize where you get more job exclusive skills, or go with the multi-classing option to borrow skills from other classes. You can then pick a trinket which gives you two points in an attribute or split one between two. I decided to go with the kendo towel for one point in speed and one point in strength. Your appearance which is just a sprite and there's a multitude of choices with some having four variants and some of these sprites are actually borrowed from the other games created by experience. And finally, attributes where you can allocate your last few free points into the last few attributes you want to put it in. Once you're registered, the story continues. You're identified as the final person worth mentioning that got trapped. Shortly after this, the sequence plays where you're waking up by the girl sleeping and then eating your comrades. And then the game begins. After the girl is gone, you regain feelings in your legs and you're the only one left of your group, left heavily injured and bleeding. We need to return to base camp, while praying the girl does not find us. Luckily for us, there isn't a mechanic where the girl is hunting you down just yet. Keyword, just yet. After healing ourselves, we finally gain control of the game. And man, let me tell you guys, once we have control of the game, I felt this unnerving feeling. We're plopped in the middle of this mine with no map filled out or direction. We're just alone. The music that plays in the background even has this eeriness about it. I was getting this freaky feeling that something was gonna jump at me at any time I walked around, but... We have to progress on, and thankfully, nothing really happened so far. After walking a bit, our radio finally communicates to us, and it's someone named Hanba, asking us if we reached Camp 2 yet. But if we haven't reached it yet, then instead return back to him, which I presume to be Camp 1. We also learn that the radio is actually a portable transceiver. It only receives messages. It can't send anything back. What kind of cheap technology is this? Regardless, we continue onwards through this dark mine finally coming across this green skull and our first encounter. Sometimes encounters can be random, and other times there are these skull icons you walk onto. This little rat guy here is one of the Yomi races that live in the labyrinth, which essentially are the monsters that live here. After defeating the rat guys, the Argin battery in our hand reacts to the resource that they dropped, giving us Argin. This battery allows us to absorb and accumulate Argin in the area automatically. Argin cannot exist on its own outside of Yomi, so the special battery is able to contain it. We venture and stumble around until we eventually found our way back to the base camp. There are no quest objective markers or compass to tell us where we're going, so we just kind of have to, you know, stumble around until we get there. I love but am also terrified by this gameplay aspect, because we just don't know if we're heading in the right direction or towards death. Inside the base camp, we go to meet our supervisor in the admin tent, and here is where we meet Hanba in the flesh. He's here from Yomi Corp, and he's here to help our company Cassandra Co. with the whole entire mining operation. We report back to him all that's happened, and he chews us out for our dead comrades. And this is where we can finally create our party with the same customization settings. My party included Nettie, my sorcerer, Neural the tank, 
Texas the Samurai Fencer, Dr. Amiya the Medic, and Lemon my Hunter. If you recognize any of these names, then you know what's up. A really forgiving part about this game is the fact that you can never really mess up making your character or your party members. Whether the situation may be, oh, you picked the wrong job and you don't like that one, or you picked the wrong skill or put a point into the wrong attribute, you can freely edit at any point just by going back to the skill menu or going back to the admin tent. After assembling my party, we left the tent and we meet up with Kaori Sandra, or Cassandra, our president. She heard about what happened to my previous squad and mostly laments about the fact that all the resources poured into them is now just wasted rather than care about the lives lost. Eh, kind of cold of her, but she's not that bad, trust me. I decided to read some of the lore of the game before venturing off. How the Undernauts came to use magic and be strong enough for the monsters in Yomi is because they undergo surgeries and supplements provided by Yomi Corp. And also, said powers can only work within Yomi when you're around a large abundance of Argent, so once you're outside, said person will be reduced back to a normal human being with their normal strength. The transporter used to connect Yomi to our world is the Chinoa Gate and the fusion reactor is a power generator that uses Argent as fuel, and as of right now, that's our current problem. Our fusion reactor isn't working right now, and we need to use that to get out of Yomi. The fusion reactor is also used to create weapons or other necessary tools for Undernauts. I head into the residential tent, and I hear the radio playing Namen Nayo, which is almost always playing, and it's this little Japanese song that's popular amongst all the Undernauts. It's kind of a gem, not gonna lie. Here's where you can check your Argent to Yen exchange rate. This is more for fun and doesn't really have any bearings on the real gameplay. And talk to Cassandra occasionally from time to time to get her feedback on what's going on in the world. <laughs> We head back out to Yomi Mine District 99 with the goal of reaching Camp 2. And it's back to our anxiety-inducing gameplay. The first-person dungeon navigation really just adds tension to the game, with us being unable to see what's ahead of us because it's so dark right now. But with a full squad, we should be able to take on most fights so I'm not as scared and lonely anymore. Still scared, though. We come across a dead end, and Hamba comes out to greet us. He says he finds it strange that we went the wrong way and we headed off west when we should have gone north then east to Camp 2. He gives us our first door flower, which helps us change the structure of Yomi. Using this, as the name entails, creates a door for us at certain walls. You can tell which wall based on the blue effect when you're walking right into it. After walking around a bit, we found our first purple pink magenta-like skull, and defeating the tough enemies here will actually light up the area around us, so that way we can actually finally have light. While I'm here fighting this rhino guy, I just want to say that the colors and the designs of the enemies are just perfect for that unsettling look. This rhino man with his slightly bloodied hammer and his odd smiling really gave me a sense of, oh shit, this guy really loves the fight and he could probably tear me apart. It's a stark difference when compared to the rat guys who are just kind of silly and cute looking, while this guy gives off the sign of, okay, he doesn't mess around, it's a kind of sit up in your seat kind of fight. Also, this sort of mini boss music right here just really bangs. Whoever did the music behind this game, fantastic job. After defeating the enemy, we get a chest, and sometimes there are traps, and if you succeed in the check, you dodge the trap and get the rewards. And as we're venturing to Camp 2, I find... limbs? Sticking out of a vent in a ground? Uh, and I pick up a scalp? This game really just knows how to make me feel dread inside. Finally, we find the path that leads to Camp 2 and head inside. We're greeted by the people of Camp 2 and... Oh! Uh, um, it appeared nobody survived this attack. This camp was ran by Yomi Ten too, a much larger corporation than us, and for them to be wiped out and have the manpower and backing that we don't have? This is not looking good for us. Shortly after, a girl in a wheelchair appears. She's covered in bandages, including her face. She tells us to leave her be and how she doesn't want to feel anyone else dying. We try to converse with her more, but she doesn't want to speak. So instead, we decide to take her back to camp because, well, she seems kind of helpless right now. As we go back, she occasionally breaks her silence to ask if we're saving her out of pity, and she also mentions that she has nothing left, saying things like the lights in both her eyes, her legs, her past and future are all gone. All she has left is this cursed power. It's very much clear that she's not a normal girl at all. When we've made it back to camp, she mentions something about a power being here and then wheels herself off to the reactor. She unwraps the bandages on her right arm, blood trickling down. She dips her finger in the blood and smears it onto the reactor. And it turns on, calling herself the Spirit Tree Sacrifice, saying that this is her destiny to do so, and no matter the world, will always see her duty complete. After hearing what happened, Hanba excitedly runs over to the Chinoa gate to see if it works. And for a split second, it does. 
before it turns off again. The fear of whether or not we'd leave this place starts to really kick in. And then we receive a message from an unknown voice. The voice speaks to us in a polite but condescending way, telling us how our chase of fortune has led us to being on the brink of death. The voice tells us that they're also responsible for this entrapment, and the reason why? To have us all die. We will soon be attacked just like Camp 2 and slaughtered by the mad sinners, and the only possible way to survive is to kill the sinners before they kill us. And if we stack the corpses of the sinners enough, our path to freedom shall open. Wishing us a great day, and then he goes silent. This news shakes up everyone at the camp and we all take a day to recover from it. And to make matters even worse, the transceiver receives a message from the outside, saying that the repairs for the gate would take at least two months to fix, and our camp only has three weeks of supplies, making the rescue near impossible and all hope seems to be lost. We share a cup noodle with Hanba, and in this brief moment of respite, the act of eating a cup of noodles comfort us just a little bit. With no other way of being saved, we're back on our task of getting out of Yomi. Kill the sinners and go home. Our goal seems simple, but to get there, it'll be a long journey. Before we headed out, I decided to talk to the girl in the wheelchair, who is now named Lucy. Huh. Just like the name we heard earlier in the game. She gives us a bit of lore, explaining to us that whenever the Mad King wished for a miracle from the spirit tree, her blood was offered to it. Forcing her to be hurt in the process, from having her limbs and head being plucked off to her heart being pierced by blades. But, she cannot die. Her scars never heal, her body is broken, and her soul and memories are both shattered. No longer remembering her past and finding herself all alone in Yomi. And it really makes you think, how long did she endure her torture for? We asked her about the girl in red, and she has no idea who that is. But what she does know is that the monsters that slaughtered Camp 2 came from up north, so maybe that's where the center is at. And finally, telling us that the fusion reactor is known to her as the Mad King Spirit Tree. Made by the Mad King of the Forest of the Deaf. That's his full title, you have to say it like that. This tree has the ability to create miracles that can change the world. And the miracle that was granted to us by the tree is the blessing of regeneration. And this serves as a gameplay mechanic where we cannot game over if we die. So, lucky for us. If we die, we just end up back at the camp with 1 HP and have to go back and revive everybody at the residential camp. And with that, our real journey can begin kill the sinners, and get our freedom. This game shop mechanic consists of us essentially breaking down equipment that we don't need to convert into flower points for flower-related goods or argent for creating equipment. You can also upgrade your equipment at the fusion reactor, but I'll say this now, the further you upgrade a weapon, the more expensive it will cost for later upgrading levels. But when you do upgrade a weapon, it does go a long way. When you upgrade a weapon, it does more damage, and when you upgrade equipment, it will have more defense. And you will find yourself having to grind a bit if you want a piece of equipment that has better stats but lacks the upgrades to give you enough defense to tackle on harder fights, so get ready for a bit of grinding. But before we finally head out, Cassandra comes out to remind us of the three company rules. Number one, do not rely on someone's orders and guidance. Number two, explore everywhere you can. And finally, number three, try everything possible. All of these rules kind of apply to us when we're playing the game, actually, so keep these rules in mind when you're going through it yourself. She even tells us about the Undernaught tasks, which are essentially the side quests of the game. Clear them for some rewards and as well increasing your rank as an undernaught. There are 10 ranks of being an undernaught with rank 1 being the highest but no one's ever reached that rank before. The highest rank ever achieved was rank 2 by the legendary undernaught Rock Arahori, a former pro wrestler turned undernaught. As we move about in the mine sometimes we get random messages from our transceiver. Sometimes it's useful information, fun tidbits, or lore stuff. And something that I want to point out that took me quite a while to learn was that enemies have attributes and types when targeted. Use this to abuse the enemy's weaknesses whether it be using the correct weapons or spells. Early game is rough as you'll do a lot of backtracking to get back to the base camp to get supplies or to heal up. Thankfully, not too long from now, we do get an item that lets us recall the base without ever depleting, but until then, we're kind of stuck having to run back to base every single time. There's even that SMT conversation-like feature with the Yomians. It's nothing crazy, it's just a talk, run, or fight option, and this randomly just appears whenever. And oh my god, I swear, this music just gives me the creeps every single time I hear it. As we progress, we find a sign that is in Yomian the language of the Yomians, and conveniently, we do have a dictionary on hand. And the sign reads, Chief Warden's Nest. 
don't wake him up. We run into our first ever non-hostile Yomian, this rat guy. He gives us information on his boss and how abusive he is towards his workers. We encounter another rat man, but this time he's being kind of greedy and doesn't want to part away with an item that he has. Killing him would give us the crimson dress. And finally, this rhino man tells us where the boss was, and he's currently taking a nice nap at the bottom of this hole. He also tells us that the boss is sensitive to smells, especially if it's human's blood. If he smells something he likes, he wakes up, but if he smells something he hates, he gets angry. And he also likes the smell of women's blood specifically. The rhino even asked us if we like women's blood. I responded no, and he says, well, too bad, I would have given you something nice. So I repeated the same dialogue options once more and lied to him this time and got the item anyways. He's not a bright guy. We find the hole where the boss was and found a perfect spot to throw items in. Being careful, I only threw in things that are related to women, so I threw in the scalp, bloody school ID, and the crimson dress. After throwing everything in, he stops snoring, and it gets really quiet. Then he jumps his big ass right at us, Jesus! And <laughs> I'm gonna be real here, I'm gonna censor this part because I don't know if I'll get in trouble with YouTube, but it's like two bodies of naked women it seems, I'm not taking any risk. And here he is, our first sinner, the violent one, the murderous chief warden. He says he'll break us, and we can't allow that because uh, I, don't, I don't like being broken, so. This boss is just imposing. The music and his image together, it really sums up the feeling that you're fighting something much larger and massive than what you're used to. And the boss is no slouch either. He really does pack a punch, putting my MC at 16 HP on the first turn. Thankfully, we cleared the fight with only Neural and Texas going down, so no EXP for them, unfortunately. After defeating the boss, he dissipates into Argent Light, leaving behind a sports car photo? Um, it'll have meaning, just give it a moment. Leaving behind in his place a stone-shaped flower, Touching it does nothing, so I guess we'll just have to come back to this later? We report it back to Hanba, and the sinner we defeated has never been recorded before. We show him the photo, and it's a man he's seen before. The photo says the twelfth prey of Gunma. And the man in the photo was a serial killer. He was caught five years ago and executed, but how this photo got into Yomi? is a mystery. But we're gonna have to worry about this later because we have to get this relic to Lucy. She reacts to the photo by telling us that she feels the power of the sinner's dark soul. Offering this to the spirit tree will grant us miraculous powers. We politely ask for her help. We can also order her, but that sounds too aggressive. She takes the photo and soaks it in her blood and then places it into the furnace of the reactor. There's a flash and one of the lights on the Chinawa gate lights up, hinting to us that we need to kill at least eight or so sinners. And typically after defeating a big boss, we're granted the ability to create new items a new flower item to help us navigate with the new parts of the dungeon, new upgrading levels for items, and finally some info on the center we faced. This time, the ability to make ladder flowers is given to us, and we also receive the return flower. This was the free teleport back to base at any point in the game for the most part, and it's extremely useful. This soul of the center is bounded by violence, which very much matches the serial killer that we heard of earlier. Yomi is home to many centers, and gathering enough relics will possibly lead to a great miracle, and the miracle we're looking for is a way back home. After helping us, the girl fall silent and we're back at it again. I decided to read a description of the sinner and read about how he brutally killed and forced monsters to be his slave in Yomi. The photo belonged to a young man who was the infamous killer and kidnapper that Hanba mentioned earlier. He operated in the Kanto region of Japan. His method involved luring young victims into his car. His twelfth victim managed to escape him from an abandoned mine in which he was held at. He was apprehended and trialed. In his public testimony, he expressed great regret at the fact that he was unable to kill his final victim. So it seems that the sinners that we fight are very much reflections of their past lives. Humans with very malicious and evil intentions. Now that we can make ladder flowers, I remember seeing a hole in the ground that needed a ladder, so we should head there. On our way over, we received a call from the mysterious voice again. He surprised we defeated the sinner and didn't think much of us as novice undernauts. And tells us to keep going and see what happens next. He has a unique ringtone every time he calls us, so keep this in mind for later. Using the ladder flower, we make our way to the next area. The ground is covered in murky and fetid smoke smelling water. And you may realize, there's no music playing. Yeah, this area has no music. It's that creepy. Not too far from where we entered, we find a dead body with a note that reads, Beware of the spider woman's smile. She laughs when she lies. And shortly thereafter, we encounter said spider woman. She refers to the area that we're in as the disposal level. Disposing of people by use of dragon tanks. There are four dragon tanks in this area, with the most powerful one being the twin-headed dragon tank, just being east of here. Getting too close in that direction will have him shooting fires at you from a long distance, so don't go over there just yet. 
Our goal now is to defeat the other weaker dragon tanks because they supply the twin-headed one with power. Defeating the dragon tanks isn't enough to stop them. They actually have an auto repair feature that heals them full shortly after. To shut them down for good, we need something called the stop spell. And after walking around a bit, we find a dead body with a note that reads, the real spell is behind the fake spell. Keep this in mind for later. I revisited the spider lady because frankly, I was getting a bit lost trying to find the spell. We do now have a new keyword to talk to her about the stop spell. And she actually tells us the stop spell parchment is just nearby in the northeast. But she laughs while telling us this. We go to where she tells us and we find a corpse with the torn parchment. Reading this parchment tells us careful with the execution weapon. Stop spell is the mechanical dragon number plus 1000. Using our big brains we remember that she was laughing while telling us this. Not only that but the note that we found earlier said the real spell is behind the fake spell. Taking a few short steps and inspecting the ground we found yet another parchment the Dirty Parchment. This time, this spell is the Dragon Mechanical Number plus 731. Why 731? I'm not sure. But I'll believe this over the Spider Lady. Luckily for us, the purple enemy right nearby is the dragon we can test this out on. After defeating the dragon, we have an option to check both parchment papers before putting in the code. The dragon's number seems to be the Trial Mark 1, so I'm assuming it's 1 plus 731. So we input that into the stop spell, and... It worked. I'm not sure what would happen if I input the wrong code, so that's up to you to find out or someone else to make that mistake. We turn off the other dragon tanks and we finally face the boss. The twin-headed dragon tank, also known as the Reckless Sinner. He really doesn't say much except roaring at us and we go right into battle. And because I grinded a little bit before this fight, it was fairly easy to take down. We input the stop spell with <laughs> the dragon's number being 659 plus 731. I did bust out the calculator for this one. And he was defeated, leaving behind the stone flower again and the old bible as the relic. After offering up the relic to the girl, we get the mind key flower, more weapon enhancements, and the lore of the dragon tank. Lucy then tells us that something is about to happen soon. Uh, kinda ominous, but okay. Talking to Cassandra reveals that there was a secret investigation that was happening under Yomi Corp. Everyone that was involved in the investigation of this district died, including the legendary rank 2 under not Rock Arahori. The corporation covered it up as the death of Arahori would affect everyone severely, because having your best under not dying isn't really the best way to encourage new under to take up the job. Reading the background of the dragon tank reveals the Bible belonged to an elderly man who was a senior officer in charge of military weapon development. Records tells us that he performed horrific human experiments. After Japan lost the war, he was granted immunity in a backdoor deal with the victorious nations. He proceeded to live the rest of his life devoting himself to a religion as a way of repenting for his crimes. When he passed, he left behind his Bible that he cherished greatly. Now with the mind key, we can now look for those locked doors that we saw earlier in the game. And then as we walked around, that familiar ringtone came through. And it's him, that voice. The man on the radio wants to introduce someone to us. His daughter. He tells us to be kind and play with her until she's finished devouring us. That ringtone plays once more and then he tells her to go devour us. <laughs> There's no way that this is actually a game mechanic. Uh no way. She will now hunt us down in the game when we least expect it. Luckily, she will leave after we're done battling her or return back to base, but whenever that man broadcasts again, she will be there. So I immediately ran back to base every single time this happened. As we continued, we ran into this mimic-like creature. Thankfully, he is friendly and he only requests for one Chateau de Bloc. I hope I said that right. It's a restoration item, but I highly recommend you instead give it to the mimic. In exchange, the mimic will let you into the treasure dungeon where you can get a high number of rare items. Bring a lot of door flowers because once you're in, you can't go back in unless you have more chateau. Nearby, we find an androgynous looking person with mechanical limbs. This is the cyborg, and he takes one good look at us and then loses interest in us, thinking we're nobody under knots, and he gloats about knowing more about the Yomi than anyone else. But he'll gladly share more about what he knows if we provide him with rare Yomi artifacts. The next section for the third center is rather straightforward. We ignore the fact that the spider woman wants to breed us and instead ask her about the area because that's way more important. Telling us that this is basically a prison with wardens and the correction officer manages everything. The corrections officer is also a devout believer in the unified god. This is something important, so keep this in mind. Many people in this prison are those who fought against the unified god. We finally find the correction officer, the gluttonous sinner. He says to us, praise to be the unified god Arter. He wants us to hand over our soul and, well, refusing to do so will have you drop down to a pit below and you don't want to backtrack, so just say yes. After we finally hand him our soul, yes I did say no the first time, he judges us and deems that our soul isn't tainted yet, but also calls us a hideous demon child? Mm, okay, demon child? But to remain sinless we need to do good deeds, and what kind of good deeds does he want us to do? 
Get him the brains of escaped convicts. We need the brains of a specific mouse man and rhino man. After handing them both the brains, he consumes them, but he's not yet satisfied and wants our brain next. His battle features two adds, but honestly, he's kind of a pushover. The only thing hard about him is the fact that he's an undead type, so most of my melee weapons didn't do much damage. Defeating him gives us the psych evaluation. We head back to the camp, but there's trouble. Monsters have appeared. They came out of the gate, and we gotta stop them. Luckily for us, the blessing of regeneration is on our side, so we'll never lose it. No way that actually just happened. Yeah, so if you actually die here, it's a game over, so you have to play carefully. In the tents, we have to fight these scary bug-looking enemies, and Hanba was hiding behind the reactor like a baby. Shake my head. After clearing out the tents, we hear Lucy scream. She's cornered by monsters, and the monsters are telling us if we move, she'll die. So we have to sacrifice ourselves or not. We lower our weapons, and he takes a stab at our HP to dangerously low numbers, and we're put into a tough fight facing three Yomian warriors. We made it through the fight, but man, being a hero is rough sometimes. After defeating them, we get... A bird statue, uh, okay. The girl questions why we sacrificed ourselves, and we just say that we wanted to protect her. She scolds us, but you know, what's done is done. We celebrate at the camp that night because we showed those stupid Yomians what we're made of, and we're not gonna lie down and just die. Everybody's all happy and jolly, and the girl looks like she was even smiling. Lucy smiling? The next day, Hanba gives us a music player that plays Yazakin's Namen Nayo. Awesome. I mean, the song is a banger, and after all, all Undernauts love Yazakin. This is a foreshadow device. Cassandra gives us the large door flower, which lets us place a teleporter spot for anywhere in the Yomi dungeon. Why is she now just giving us this? Oh, well, because it's a rare item, and even if Yomi Corp knows she has it, then she'll have her mining rights revoked. Okay, fair. Well, although we get one for now, we do get multiple later, so you can place multiple teleporting spots in different places of the Yomi Labyrinth. We hand Lucy the third relic, and it lets us make the forest key flowers. The background of the corrections officer can now be read. In his previous life, he was a neurosurgeon who was hailed as a genius for his prodigious skills, but later was implicated in a grotesque incident where he reportedly ate a human brain. A psych exam deemed him in insane and he was placed into a mental hospital only to escape a few days later and never seen again. Hanba suggests giving the old bird statue to someone who knows about Yomi, and well, who else better than the cyborg that we met earlier? The statue is of the God of Light from the Divine Ages. He returns the favor by giving us a few answers to some questions. His name is Hajuji, and he's a Yomi researcher. He's wandered Yomi ever since he was fired from his last job two years ago. What a way to go out. And he lost his limbs because of a mistake on the job. Yikes. But he refuses to tell us anything more until we're on the same level as Rock Arahori. And finally, the statue is from the other world, and the other world being where literally anything related to Yomi was from before. Another dimension might be the best way to describe it. He gives us a parting gift, the Sensitivity Stone. That'll activate the stone flowers we saw from the three previous bosses that we fought, so technically we have three more zones to go through. He recommends that we start with the containment level first, being the prison where we just fought the corrections officer. On our way over to the containment section, we get another call from the man on the radio, telling us that he was the one who sent the monsters to attack us, and, uh, that was it. Uh, okay, man. Big surprise. Touching the stone flower, we end up at the Pilgrimage Cemetery, this dark and rainy forest, with no music playing in the background. Yeah, that fear is coming back again. Here we find the grave of Duke Murfin, an apostate. Nearby are two mosquito women who are huge fans of this duke. From them, we learn that Duke Murfin was a saint who made the mistake of listening to this mad king. Then after that, he wanted to reform Arterism, which is like basically the religion for this unified god, Ardor. The duke's mother, Luminara, saw this as an act of sin and punished her son. The two mosquito women are also not huge fans of the seven saints who fought alongside the god of light to destroy the god of darkness. These to deviate from the unified god's teaching of fusing light, dark, and neutrality. And lastly, there is a cathedral that we'll gain access to once we are blessed by all seven saints. But to do so, we need to get their blessing by restoring their titles to the graves. The puzzle of this section is to simply find the graves, read the epithet, fill in the blank of the saint who would fit the description, and receive their blessing in the form of an azure wing. However, when making progress, we start to hear a voice of a man telling us to basically stop, and the voice of the man eventually shows himself to be this mosquito man named Duke Murfin himself the envious sinner. When you finally get the last blessing, the duke shows up angry and wants us dead. The battle was annoying because he will inflict so much status ailments onto your team, but besides that, he's overall not too bad, but 
still pretty annoying. After defeating him, no relic shows up, which is really odd, but we hear a voice telling us to go to his grave. Here's where we receive his game-ending note and another stone flower. We enter Luminaris Cathedral, and it's really hard to tell if this was made to worship a god or devil based on the weird scary statues around. This is a movement-based puzzle where on the first floor you can't stray too far away from the statues or you'll fall to the ground. And you fall all the way down to this dark basement-like area with no music playing in the background, and you can occasionally hear this low bell bellowing sound in the distance. It freaked me out and I just left. I decided to come back here later. And also the enemies were tough anyways. After turning in the Duke's Relic we get the Healing Flower which nullifies all hazardous tiles of an area. Lucy then tells us how she appreciates how we don't hurt her. Oh, poor child. We do have the backstory of Duke Murphin. The backstory of this one is about a sickly young man who lived in a small farming village. One night he crept into the homes of dozens of villagers and murdered them before taking his own life. But he only took the life of anybody who's ever mistreated him, including his own relatives. The man did not kill indiscriminately though, he spared the lives of anyone who begged for it, including children that he knew. A bit after, we then get another call from the man on the radio, this time he wants to talk about the Divine Child, aka Lucy, and how he would hurt her to create create his own miracles. What a sick man. I decided to go back to the first center we fought and use their flower stone instead. We ended up at the Tower of Alchemy, this large golden tower building-like thing. Here we find Hai Zhuzhi again, who tells us that we shouldn't progress unless we have the flower that can erase strong Yomians and look elsewhere instead, so I listened to him because you know, why else would he lie to us? So I decided to go back to the cathedral instead to try to make some progress and we're stopped by this mosquito woman who gives us some lore. The cathedral was built a few years after the unified god came. Pope Luminaris has been the head of the cathedral since. Instead of this world having three different gods of light, dark, and neutral, the unified god Ardor was born. Ardor changed the forms of humans to demons and broke the barriers between species, ending the conflict between light and dark. Now throughout the game we keep hearing the term demon child, but what is it exactly? Basically it's people who look like humans in their world but don't have the blessing of the unified god. Devout parents of this religion would be so ashamed by the demon children that they would abandon their kids in a place called the Dying Light Forest. To progress we need to give this woman some money, then right after we're met with this one-eyed woman who tells us to offer our own blood. Blood. She actually hurts my team, goes crazy, and demands us to die. It was a tough fight, but we made it through. The next floor had some falling mechanics again, and I decided to come back to this later because I just didn't feel like dealing with this. Instead, I went to the flower where the dragon tank was and ended up at the Dying Light Forest that we heard about a second ago. Right off the bat, we actually run right into the Anguished Sinner, the Dying Light Angel who refuses to battle us. They're more concerned about getting new orders from their boss or something, so I just leave them be. After a little bit of walking, we run into this large man with a big sword sword. Like, holy cow, he's big. Now, thankfully, he doesn't fight us and instead tells us we're really weak and would drop dead instantly from the poison swamps here. But having the healing flowers here will completely negate the poison. He takes off and honestly, it's hard to tell if he's here to help us or if he's even human or Yomian. Throughout the forest, we find these robot soldiers and they're kind enough to tell us their purpose of what they're doing here and even offers us a free teleport to the start of the dungeon. The goal of this area here is to find each of the soldiers, listen to their story of what happened here, and we learn that these soldiers have been on standby guarding this forest for a long time without new orders and essentially are starting to lose their purpose. After making a lot of progress in this dungeon, and let me tell you, it took a long while to get here, we run into the large man again. He tells us he's bored and hasn't heard Yazakin in a long time and is starving for entertainment, so he's an undernaught. Okay. Albeit a really large undernaught man, but he looks like he's on our side, so we'll take it. Luckily, we have our music player and he gets really excited over seeing it, so we give it to him. He's happy and then he reveals to us that he is Rock Arahori. Wait, Rock? As in the rank 2 undernaught? Wait, he's still alive? And he hands us our first promotion Argent, which, as you can tell by the name, can promote units. I'd love to ask him more questions, but we don't have that option, unfortunately. But he does tell us that the area up ahead is the disposal grounds for demon children. According to Haijuji, the other world's mad king was abandoned here too. I, I guess they know each other, maybe? We find a corpse of a monster with a scroll called the DLA Directive, and just nearby we find a stone tablet buried here. Reading it says, I have been abandoned as a demon child because I am shaped like a cursed being. I have been raised by the whims of a mechanical doll. I now know the fate residing in my demonic right hand. I swore to destroy the false god and bring about the world of the demon children. And if you haven't guessed it, with the two robots nearby mentioning how they raised the Mad King, this is indeed his backstory. We finally hand the DLA directive over to the boss, and then it's go time. We fight them and get our ass whooped. <laughs> so we came back after a bit of grinding and we took them on finally. And their relic was a magazine article. 
Okay, interesting. The active stone flower appears and we take it to go to an old building shrouded in dust clouds. This is the Dying Light Alliance Stronghold. We give the relic over to Lucy and we're granted the deletion flower, which allows us to delete strong, powerful enemies so we can take on the gold alchemy tower. The mysterious man calls on us once again to congratulate us on defeating the fifth sinner. He then speaks to Lucy and says, now it's time to be released from the cage of oblivion. Come, remember me, along with the memories of terror and pain. Then Lucy starts to lose her mind, we try to calm her down, but nothing was working. Now we have a new objective, to try and save Lucy from whatever she's going through. We head over to the gold tower, and the puzzle here is to essentially find three gold items to wake up the boss. And with the three items, we woke up the boss, and he is the Sinner of Desirous. He formed his gold tower to work on his alchemy, but the followers of Ardor, or the Unified God, condemned him for his heretical research. They separated his soul and body and confined him here. He does mention that he is indeed friends with the Mad King. In the past, there was an endless battle between light and dark and the neutral side being the Dragon Clan, until the Unified God came and literally unified all three aspects into one. The followers of the Unified God said that this world is true paradise, but the Mad King opposed this idea. Finally, the statue wishes for death after all of this immortality, and he summons his ass, and we prepare for a fight. And, uh, he kicks my ass, but <laughs> after a bit of grinding again, we take on the boss once more. We win and get his large document bag. We head into the next place, the Forest of the Sleeping Dragon, but we cannot progress unless we have the bridge flowers, which we cannot make yet. And because the girl is going through her weird state, we cannot give a new relic, so that means no new power, so we have to try to cure her soon. And Hamba suggests we go find an expert on the otherworldly type stuff, so who else better than Haijuji? And when speaking with Haijuji, he literally knew everything that was happening for some odd reason. His theory is that the message from the man on the radio brought back some accursed memories, and her body and spirit could not deal with the weight of those memories. But he believes that we can fix this. All we need is just the blood of the girl in the red who is hunting us. God damn it. He reveals to us that the girl in red is actually a clone of the divine child Lucy, created by Yomi Technology. He hatches a plan to bait her into finding us, and we get her blood. He also fakes a radio signal, so now it's time for us to hunt her instead. We finally run into Lucy, or I'll call her Red Lucy in this case, and we battle her, and honestly, it was kind of a breeze. I think I grinded so much that she wasn't that hard anymore, so I think the fear of her just scared me the most. We defeated her and grab her blood, but just as soon as we grabbed it, she springs back up and runs off, dropping a second large door flower for us in the process. Haijuji creates a serum for us, and we give the serum to the girl, and she begins to feel normal again. Not only that, but she suddenly can now see, and we get a large lore dump. She tells us how our and the Mad King's destinies will cross, and then she tells us about the Mad King. In another world that is different from this one, the deities of light, dark, and neutral have all departed from our world. From their departure, a new god appeared, one that we've heard of so many times at this point. Ardor, the unified god. He promised peace, and the people under him begged for it, and as a result, humans and demons were transformed. And this was the start to eternal peace. A century later, anyone who was born looking like a human were branded demon children who lacked the blessing of Ardor. They were discarded and abandoned, but one in particular was left at the Dying Light Forest. This child eventually became the Mad King. His goal was to destroy the world that Ardor created and return to when humans and demons were separated. He also possessed the power to charm others and control their hearts and minds. He led his Dying Light alliance against the Ardor Empire, the people who worship the unified God. The Mad King's army overpowered the Empire with their reliance on the ancient alchemy weapons and the miracles granted by the Spirit Tree. But their victory only lasted a short bit because they lacked the power to destroy Ardor's world, and the Mad King's alliance fell to the might of the Empire. He was then captured and sent to execution. But if he's dead now, then why can Lucy still hear his voice? Everything we encounter so far seems to be related to the Mad King, the force of death where he was abandoned, Duke Murphin, his target, the Unified God's Order, and the prison mine where he was held captive. So it seems that everything we're encountering in the Yomi is just projections of the Mad King's memories. Lucy then asks if everything was helpful, and we tell her yes because it does clear up a lot of things, and she's very happy than before. And I just feel really bad for her, she just seems really sweet and doesn't deserve all these bad things coming to her. We're able to throw in a lot of the relics we collected into the reactor, we now have the backstories for Red Lucy, the Mechanical Soldier, the Alchemy Guy, and the Mad King. I will not be reading these guys, I'm sorry, just to save time, so if you want to read these, take a second to pause. But one thing that I do want to point out is the section here on the Mad King's profile. The section where the intervention of the Unified God and the help of the Samurai Demon Child stopped the Mad King keep this in mind. We now can create the Castle Key Flower, so we can now progress in the DLA Stronghold. Inside the fortress, we find Rock Arahori again. He tells us that there's an internal struggle going on with the soldiers inside the base, and he won't have a problem getting 
through them. But because we're weak, we might have trouble. Okay, man, but he wasn't lying about the struggle. There are three leaders having a disagreement, but the gold leader wants to have the red and the blue one come together for a meeting. We act as a messenger for them, and we bring everyone together. The gold leader tells the other two that there's an assassin here to kill them all. And who is that assassin? Me. And what are they gonna do? They're gonna fight me. After beating all three leaders, the gold one tells us that the reason why he did it was to bring everyone together for one last fight, and he's sorry for tricking us. Okay. We collect his relic, the bloody helmet, and yet another stone flower appears here, so this heavily hints that there's gonna be more content for later. We finally can make the bridge flower, and the lore for the boss is shown here. The radio man contacts us once more, which I'm going to assume that this is just the Mad King at this point, telling us that this is the fourth time by that he means the fourth trial that was conducted ever in District 99. Everything from meeting the Divine Child Lucy, to fighting the sinners, to everyone dying at the camps has all happened before. But he's erased Lucy's memory before of all these past events. And every time that these trials have happened, not a single Undernaught has escaped from Yomi, including the big man himself, Iwao Arohori. He says we made it far and to carry on with our futile struggle until the moment we let out our dying screams. Every time he calls us, man, I just really want to punch him in the face. We head back over to the forest of the Sleeping Dragon, and our goal here is to kill three brothers. They all really live up to their title of being the slothful sinner, and it really shows. The youngest brother revealed how the Demon King tried to steal this treasure Yomi from the Pope to recreate the past world with the Divine Child's power. And other than that, you have to really just kill the brothers. There's not really anything too significant here in this area. We turn in the relic, but sadly, even though all the lights are on at the gate, it's not yet there. We have one more sinner to kill, and the spirit tree, or fusion reactor, yet doesn't have the power to make the flower to get us out of here. Lucy says we'll need to connect both spirit trees from camp 1 to camp 2, but she senses a terrifying demon at camp 2, so we'll need to be careful. It was pretty easy. At camp 2, we find a blue skin girl jump out, who's identical looking to Lucy. Lucy asks for the blue skin girl's help to power the tree, and she agrees. And it turns out that these blue skin girls are clones of Lucy that power the trees. These clones have a little bit of the divine child power, and these powers are amplified by the spirit trees. And sadly, these clones cannot live outside the tree, so there's nothing more we can do for them. With the spirit tree ready, we can now fight the final center at the cathedral. Making our way to the top, we reach the boss who is none other than the Pope Luminaris. But if I had to guess, this isn't the real Pope, this is something that the Mad King just conjured up out of his memories. And with her defeated, we can finally move on with our last relic, and the gate is finally open. Lucy hands us the Yomi Flower that is completely different from ones that we used before, calling it the Lucy Flower. It has the ability to pierce through Yomi and get us back to the real world. The only catch, though, is that only one person can use it. Everyone unanimously decides I should go, even though I kind of want Cassandra to go. <laughs> Hamba suggests I should head straight to Yomi Corp and speak with Director Kuzado. To inform him on what's happened and hopefully come up with a solution to get everyone out sooner. Even Lucy wants to come to our world one day because she's curious about what's out there, and I hope she does. After talking with everyone one last time, with that, it was time for me to go outside. Like, as only I go. My party doesn't go with me. I go alone. And the flower worked. We finally made it back home, but our job isn't done yet, and we rush over to the Yomi Corp building and we start thinking about the man we need to meet, the Yomi Corp director. He refuses to show his face in public and even goes by the name the Yomi King. Try not to overthink it though, he's a good man, I, I promise you. We take the elevator up to what we thought would be the Undernaught Division of the Security Division, I didn't write that, they wrote that, but instead we're taken straight to the top of the Yomi Corp building the director's office, where we come face to face with the director himself, Hideki Kuzado. And as he appears, that same familiar song plays. He's already informed of the situation and expressed his condolences to us. He even mentions how he doesn't have the best luck with gambling and could never pull the cards he wanted. But with his fourth game, his hand is finally complete. Oh yeah! It's him. The man who trapped us all in District 99 was face to face with me here in this building. But we're outside of Yomi, so we're just normal human beings. He calls upon his henchmen from the shadows and they come out with their guns ready. We are absolutely powerless to do anything and accept our impending death. He reveals to us that all the men in here are all dangerous assassins and criminals who came into contact with him, but with the power of his charm, they all became slaves to him. He is gracious enough to offer us 1 billion yen to betray our allies and everyone, and we tell him that he's out of his mind. Then we're suddenly hit by some kind of red magic attack and blackout. 
On the news, it's announced that after a week of no contact with the people outside, Yomi Corp announced the death of everyone in District 99. We wake up nearby this mountain of rubble and are suddenly attacked by this big dragonfly run. It's like a dragonfly wyvern. We make quick work of them, and judging by the fact that we have our undernaut powers back, we must be back inside Yomi. The return flower has no effect here, and instead we take the rope nearby and climb up. We end up at a mine, but this isn't District 99, but rather District Zero. As we make our way through District Zero, we slowly start to remember what happened. Under Kuzeto's control, we led him to the base camp, where we encounter Hanbo, where luckily he wasn't killed, but rather Kuzeto wanted the girl instead, Lucy. Lucy tries calling out to us, but we're unable to snap out of Kuzeto's control. Cassandra steps out to meet us and knows of Kuzeto's power of charm. Kuzeto didn't notice at first, but then he realizes who Cassandra was, calling her the Pope's pet cat, saying how he has unfinished business and won't let her die just yet. She then calls him the Mad King, and we snap back the present day. After a bit of fighting, we then start to notice something was approaching us, and it was the big man himself, Rock Arahori. How he ended up here, we have no idea, but he's nice enough to hand us some Chateau de Bloc. He tells us that District Zero is a forgotten district now turned disposal site, but it was formerly used as a Yomi testing area. He says if we want to know more, go ask Haijuji at the abandoned camp up ahead, and he asks if we would like to fight him. What the... No! He said he was just joking anyways, and he's under orders by him to not fight us, then vanishes. I don't know who him is, but let's hope it's Haijuji. We then get another vision of the past, now it's with Kuzeto, Lucy, and us. He tells us about how 25 years ago he arrived to this world with Lucy, and how he wants her to fulfill her duty for his great ambition. She thinks it's another sacrifice for the tree, and she'll just come back to life again, but instead, no, he wants her to die for good. This time, being able to kill her, regardless of the blessing of her generation. And despite Despite us overcoming the trials of District 99, he tells us that we still don't have the qualifications that he's looking for, and that's why he'll kill her. He forces us to watch as he chops off her head, killing Lucy for good. After that vision, we press forward and we finally make it to the camp to meet up with Haijuji. He tells us that District Zero is essentially a testing ground for all undernaught abilities, equipment, and etc. It was shut down two years ago and its existence is highly confidential. That mountain of rubble is essentially all that was previously there prior to Yomi's sudden arrival, and was just swallowed up by Yomi. And lastly, he talks about Kuzeto, who's an intelligent man who's doing all he does just to further his own goals by using the power of charm. In his original world, he used his ability to enslave others and started war but somehow found his way to Earth with the Divine Child. And Haijuji knew all of that, but didn't want to tell us earlier. What a jerk. He shows us something that he found from the Mountain of Rubble, and it's the wheelchair that Lucy used with her skull on top. He hands us the skull because, who knows, maybe it will come in handy later. He shows us the nearby gate, which he's able to fix and bring us back to District 99. And everything seems to be pretty much same old. Hanba steps out to call us a traitor, but we explained everything to him. He understands and also tells us that Cassandra was taken away as well. With Yomi Corp now against us on the outside, Outside and the girl being dead, this is probably why the director left everyone alive to slowly die. We reunited with our squad while Haijuji tried to figure out how to turn on the spirit tree or reactor. After hitting it and doing other things, we eventually decide to try one thing, the girl's skull. As we take it out, we hear the words, help me, I'm still here. Then in a flash, the spirit tree reactivates. Haijuji believes that this is happening because of her super argent that is still in her skull, which is essentially like her soul. He believes we can still revive her by having a replacement body and high purity argent. To get the body, we need to repeat a process from before. We need to find Red Lucy. The only problem though is the fact that she's gone into hiding since our last encounter with getting her blood. And for the high purity argent, it's used to make advanced miracles. It was even used to make the Divine Child clones. When District Zero was shut down, all of the high purity argent was taken, but there's a chance for one to still be at the area called the Casket of the Yomi King, which is basically a labyrinth in the deepest parts of Yomi used as an experimental facility to create new types of Yomi life form and clones. So with that said, let's go ahead and get her back. We go through District Zero to go to a new area called This World's Womb. Upon entering, we find that it's all water, but we can still breathe, and luckily it doesn't really affect anything other than the fact that it's just a watery level. The water is filled with a special liquid broth with argent in it. Our goal here is to kill three clones in order to proceed. All the clones are based on Rock Arahori. They're just blue, except for this guy. He's not even close. And after defeating all three clones, we find a stone flower that takes us back to District Zero, but at a different part we haven't been to yet. And just as we enter, we immediately run into the real Rock, who tells us about his past of being an undernaught until his camp was underrun by monsters and everyone was killed in his squad. And instead of finding a way out of here, he instead just decides to live in Yomi so he can keep fighting for the rest of his life. That's pretty hardcore. I actually respect that. We need to find the camp here that will lead to the other world's womb. And as we approach this 
this camp, we find a corpse with a journal nearby, titled Number Four's Diary. Reading it, we learn that it's from Lucy, but not the Lucy that we know, but a clone. Certain words are highlighted in red, such as Poisonous Forest, Father Was Abandoned, Gold Tower, and keep these all in mind. It also talks about how other numbers are getting sick, so this is clearly about the clones. It talked about how Number 4 spent time with her father, with him promising to take her to the outside world one day. Number 4 really seems to believe that she was the real Lucy too, up until she was starting to get sick herself. The last bit of the diary is gut-wrenching to read as she writes about how she's getting sick like her other clone sisters, and coming to terms with the fact that she is not the real Lucy, but just a mere clone. And to top it all off, because of her sickness, her father refused to see her for months. And it's clear that this is Red Lucy because of the left armor mark and how it got sick. It's real upsetting to see how the Mad King only see these clones as tools and then toss them all aside. We find the camp, but we're attacked by a bunch of Yomians here, and after a long series of fights, we find some more clones, number 32, 29, and 17. And in fact, this whole camp is full of them, all abandoned by the Mad King and sick, all repeating the same thing, and that's just wanting to see their father. We find the gate and turn it on so Haijuji can come over. But just as we did that, the girl started going berserk and we need to put him down. This is a part of their sickness, which makes them more aggressive and lose their sanity. The clones are born from high purity origin using the Divine Child's flesh as a base. But unlike the Divine Child, they had an adverse reaction when trying to replicate her powers, causing them to go insane or have body parts parts become monstrous, and their fate ultimately becomes either parts for fusion reactors or components for strengthening supplements. Haijuji then connects the gate to the other world's womb. This was a research district where clones were made, and this is a good chance where we can find some high purity Arjun. Haijuji also gives us some classified documents which contain some shocking info. The Sinners document reveals that the Sinners were created using criminals as a base due to their high psychological stress that they possessed. So previous Sinners were never executed, but rather used for experiments. And the other document on Undernauts revealed that the supplements we were given to to grant us the abilities were actually using the Divine Child's and the clone's blood as active ingredients. Jesus! I decided to go hunt down Red Lucy instead before I head into the next womb, visiting the areas that were highlighted in red in her journal. We first find her at the Golden Tower where she immediately attacks us and then she runs off. I head over to the Dying Light Forest to see if that's where she'll be next. I do find her here, but unfortunately there is no fight and she says that she doesn't have much time left, instead just running away. It's becoming clear that she's dying from her sickness and it felt really sad to hunt her down like this. The last area to search was the giant rubble back in District Zero, so we head down the rope and we encounter her for the last time. She doesn't even notice us, and instead she's desperately trying to make contact with her father on the radio, asking to see him one last time. She pleads and pleads, but sadly realizing that there's nothing more that she can do. She takes a nap, falls over, and becomes motionless, never getting that final head pat from her father. We pick up her body and head back to base, but man, it was really sad to see that she was met with this fate. The person who I thought would shape up to be some kind of powerful and evil boss just turns out to be another tragic victim like us. We hand the body over to Haijuji. He notes that the girl was gonna die regardless because she was reaching her limits as a clone. He also says instead of dying alone in Yomi, that us being there for her final moments must have given her some bit of comfort. Well, no use crying now, we have to proceed onwards, we throw the corpse into the reactor, and now all that's left is to get the high purity Arjun. The other world's womb is largely the same thing, just red instead of blue, and as we explore it, we come across this stone flower teleporter that takes us to a bizarre and unreal scenery, a wasteland with hyper-detailed stone statues of giant dragons, almost as if they were real at one point, and in the middle of it all, a human-like statue that's Resembling President Kaori? It's our president and CEO, but instead she has cat ears? Sadly, remaining here won't do us any good, so we just take our leave. Same deal here as the first womb, we need to kill all three clones, but this time the clones are of... President Kaori? Wielding two swords? I I have no idea what's going on at this point, but I'm not going to question it. After defeating all three clones, I kind of got lost because I wasn't sure where to go next, so I went to revisit the Wasteland Flower. The area started to shake violently. We're taken back to where we were before, but this time, President Kaori is back! but with cat ears. We saved her and she tells us that the Mad King was wanting to make clones of her. She tells us that she's actually his enemy this whole time and she was the very same samurai that served under Pope Luminaris and battled him in the other world. She was able to corner the Mad King before he used the Divine Child to create a miracle which transported all three of them to our world. 
and ever since she lost her powers as a warrior. As she headed back to camp, the High Purity Argent appears and we take it. Before we continue, I wanted to get a bit more information from Cassandra. She says her original purpose was to track down and kill the Mad King, but when she came to our world, she kind of lost interest going after him. Even she wasn't a huge fan of the other world not being so kind to demon children who look like humans like her. But now that Kuzeto has dragged our company into the mix, she's now made it personal. And the wasteland where we found Kaori was actually part of the Mad King's memory of when he single-handedly decimated the dragon army with his weapon, the Black Sun. Also, yeah, the ears are real. Those are actually a part of her. She just hid it from us for a long while. With the replacement body and the high purity Argent, we were able to finally revive Lucy. Lucy comes back without all of her bandages and wounds, but she's not yet there yet. She seems to be not fully conscious yet. What was going on? Why wasn't she waking up? She then breaks the silence by humming to herself. Humming that same familiar tone we've heard before. She started to speak to herself, telling herself to wake up. This was the voice of Red Lucy. Red Lucy is begging for her to wake up so they can get revenge on their father. And after a bit, Lucy the Divine Child finally wakes up. As a nice little return, we give her a head pat, as that's what the other Lucy would have wanted. She tells us that the Mad King is trying to make a new sacrifice and use this Yomi treasure to make his goals come true. The Yomi treasure was created by the god of her world and used by those with the divine blessing to create a world they wished for. The Mad King tried to take it but failed, then the treasure went out of control and came to our world. The treasure created a small world using the Mad King's memories as its foundation. The Mad King lacked the divine blessing and that's why he couldn't use the treasure. And that's why he tried to use Lucy, but unfortunately for him, that's still wouldn't work. Probably because she was the divine child of another world and not this one. So he's after something else now, but we just don't know what. Lucy wants to help us fight the Mad King and no longer wants to cower and be scared. Let's go, Lucy! The Mad King then contacts us and essentially taunts us with his plans being nearly done. In that, in 24 hours, he'll destroy all of the civilization on Earth to create his new kingdom over the ruins and the corpse of everyone. Lucy rushes over to the gate, but she can't activate it just yet because she's still weak from waking up. She suggests that our power as an Undernaut can be be enough to open up the gate to the Mad King if she bestows the Divine Child blessing to us. This blessing can only be given by the Divine Child to whom they wish for. And this is what the Mad King failed to realize. She asked us to take revenge and cut herself, and with her blood it should be enough to give us the blessing. And the gate opens to Yomi's womb, the final area of the game. Lucy faints, but she'll be okay. And just as this was all happening, we hear on the radio that the other camps and Yomi were being under attack by a massive amount of monsters. The radio urged the rest of the camps to fight on and do what they can until they figure out how to stop this. And oh shit, the music changes. This song is hyping me up so much for this final encounter. Hanba gets all determined and gives us a speech to go and kill the Mad King. Cassandra prepares a syringe filled with scarlet liquid that will make the user resist the Mad King's charm. At worst, the side effects will melt our brain, but We'll take it. We tell her to pay for our clinical trial, and she says if we manage to escape, she'll give us a big reward. God damn. And it seems like we're ready, so let's go ahead and fight the Mad King. Haijuji requests, if possible, he would like his corpse to dissect later. Lovely. We made it to the final section of the game, and honestly, there's not really much to say about it. You have to pass five different trials before you can finally face the director. And here in this room, we come face to face with the director. And his grand plan was to wait for us, an earthling with the divine child blessing. All of this was done so we can get the trust of Lucy, and then he tried to manipulate us with his charm. Too bad for him, the anti-charm serum works. So he decides to beat us into submission by using the large pillar in the back, the nation birthing great tree, to summon an infinite army of himself. After two tough sets of battles with two clones each, it becomes clear unless we do something about that tree, he'll summon an infinite number of enemies to his heart's desire. But lucky for us, Lucy jumps out of the blue, stopping the tree and healing us to full, so it's looking real good for us. Kuzeto blasts her away with magic. She's okay, don't worry. Then, that final piano piece starts playing. With his tree cut off, he decides to take matters into his own hands. To power himself up, he takes one of the orbs in the room, which appears to be his legendary Black Sun weapon used to take out the dragons years ago. And the final battle begins. Honestly, the battle isn't that bad. It's made more annoying because he can inflict confusions onto your team. It took me nearly 10 minutes to beat him, but we finally did it. Kuzeto gets off the floor and refuses to accept defeat. And just as we're about to finish him off, he decides to use the tree to sacrifice himself, turning himself into Argent and disappearing. And oh, hey, we beat the mission. And I actually love the reward here, it made me chuckle. And with that, we brought an end to the Mad King. And Lucy tells us that she feels Red Lucy's presence in her and she feels at peace. We were all able to escape Yomi and we were back outside again. 
But unfortunately, not everything was meant to be, as Yomi Corp branded us as terrorists and hold us responsible for all the bad that happened. The Mad King had a backup plan, and even if we won over him, we wouldn't be able to live in peace back home with our new statuses as terrorists. With the help of Cassandra's connections, we were all able to flee to an island south of the mainland Japan. On the bright side, all the Argent we collected netted us a large sum of money. We just can't share that with all of our old friends, family, and lovers, unfortunately. And just as we were lost in our melancholy thoughts, Lucy looks up at us and says, No matter how many lies are told, there is only one truth. This beautiful world is safe and it's all thanks to you. And that is the end of Undernaught's Labyrinth of Yomi. Our final report shows everyone being extracted out and the credits roll. I remembered when the credits were rolling, thinking to myself, no way, there's no way it can end there. What about those other stone flowers that never opened up? What are we gonna do about that? And what about Rock Arahori? Whatever happened to him? Well... Our transceiver receives a message from Haijuji. He asks how we're doing and how he can only remain in Yomi because of his mechanical parts only working there. Then he updates us on something that happened at the Yomi ward that Yomi Corp is keeping under wraps. A Yomian appeared at Yomi station. Earth weapons lack Argen so they couldn't damage the Yomian. And with Undernauts being unable to activate their powers outside of Yomi, the Yomian went on a rampage. Thankfully, Yomians cannot be without Argent for long since they're bound by it, so it disappeared after five minutes, but if this happened now, it could happen again. In the history of the Yomi Project, it's the first time in 25 years that this happened, and coincidentally, around the time of when the Mad King was defeated. Haijuji wants us to come back to District 99 because he believes it's all connected, and he wants us to lend our powers to help. It's hard to ignore this because, well, if we do, people could get hurt, so with the help of Cassandra's connections, we're able to sneak back in District 99 with fake pass ports and papers. And with that, the game isn't over yet. Here comes the post-game. Haijuji informs that there are four new unknown zones that he wants us to explore. He wants us to investigate three of them, while he and Arahori look into the last zone together. We're assigned to look into the Cathedral, the Dying Light Alliance Stronghold, and the Forest of the Sleeping Dragon. So basically where we saw the stone flowers we couldn't access before, he's activated them. I started with the forest first, and we're taken to this quiet and colorless zone, reminiscent of that of the fort that we saw earlier. I explore a bit of the area, not really sure what I'm looking for, until I finally found the gate. And as we approach it, I'm ambushed by one of the three dragon brothers from earlier? Wait a second, he's supposed to be dead. Wait, what? He tells us that this is one of the three gates that guides the origin of neutrality to the outside world. Him and his brothers have been charmed to protect it, and we're heading straight into a battle. Defeating him allows us to destroy the gate, so it becomes clear what we have to do next. Destroy the other two portals guarded by his brothers. And to summarize the next few hours of gameplay for all three zones, we face old bosses and then close up these gates. It's literally just that. In retrospect, the game Gameplay does drop hard here because you're just repeating the same battles as before, just toned up to be harder. But I guess I was more enthralled by the whole mystery of what was going on that drove me to keep going. And after defeating the last boss, it's revealed that everyone we faced was essentially images and not the real person, created by someone to carry out the will of its creator. Haijuji calls to tell us that things are really bad, and Arahori did something, but before he can say, it's cut off. We need to head back to the other world's womb where the dragon's statues were, but instead we end up somewhere completely completely different. Lucy's forest, and it rained red liquid that smelled like medicine? And scattered around this forest were clones of Lucy, and they all would immediately attack us. I'm not sure why, but we had to put him down. We find Haijuji, but he's lost his mind, and just then we're ambushed by two clones. After defeating the clones, we give him a good whack, and he returns to his senses. He reveals that with Arahori, they both ran into Director Kuzido. They both try to catch the director, but for some odd reason, Arahori knocks out Haijuji instead. He tells us that this area is is a disposal site for all the Lucy clones that just didn't make the cut, and that the Red Rain here is a strengthening solution for the clones, increasing their aggressiveness. For the Mad King he saw, it wasn't a clone because he didn't possess blue skin, and it couldn't be the Mad King himself because he did die after our fight. One thing is clear though, if we do put a stop to him, we can put an end to this all. And finally, why did Arahori betray Haijuji? Arahori only ever cared about testing his strength and nothing else. But oddly enough, he never made attempts to kill sinners before as it would ruin the Mad King's tests. And he never really made any moves to get in the way of the Mad King's plans, leading us to believe he has some kind of connection to the Mad King. And if this was true, then it makes sense as to why he didn't want to fight us earlier in the game when he was under orders by him. And just as we finished asking our questions, we hear that familiar ringtone. 
The director taunts us once more by saying that he's alive and he will not stop even in death until his goals are realized. He tells us to go through three trials before we can face him, with the first trial being kill all the clones in the forest. And we have to comply or else we can't continue the game, so we have to do it. And it felt really awful to kill these clones because they were practically begging for death. And after a few kills, he would taunt us saying if we enjoyed killing. The most upsetting one has to definitely be this one. She says nothing, and when we ready our weapon to fight her, she just smiles faintly and says thank you. These poor clones. And after defeating the last clone, the Mad King calls us to say that he activated the stone flower at the bottom to allow us into his castle. This zone has many sections to it. You start off outside in this forest-like area, and then you make your way into the prison mine section, and then finally the actual castle itself. The Mad King then calls us to give a bit of lore of the castle. Previously, it was his until after his defeat, the unified god and his followers pillaged the castle and plunged it into darkness. He wanted to fight a world where the one and only god wields absolute power over anyone who defies it. And seeing how they treated people who didn't have the blessing of the god in their world, I can understand why it sucked to be there. So, I can see where he's coming from, but I don't completely agree with everything he's doing. He presents the next trial, and that is to kill all the sinners we fought before. And these are all just recreated sinners, not the ones we actually fought before. The fights are largely the same thing, just harder. Once the last sinner is defeated, we are then given one last trial. And when we walk up to this last trial, we come face to face with Rock Arahori. He says the man we're looking for has already made it out of Yomi, and he took the unique Arjun with him. The Mad King was just waiting for it to be made, so all the trials we did were just to stall us. What a jerk. But what exactly is this unique Arjun? Well, it allows someone who carries it to leave Yomi and retain their powers for a few days. And the Mad King that we've been talking to is no longer a human or demon child, but rather a Yomi, and so he'll need that when he steps outside. The Mad King we're facing now is nothing more than just a Yomian copy of the original with only one goal. To fulfill the desire of the dead Mad King, remake the world into a new one by any means necessary. Arahori then asks if we intend to chase him, and how are we gonna fight the Mad King when the second we step out of Yomi, we will have have no powers, but he does happen to have his own unique Arjun. He got it as a reward from the director after serving under him, and he's willing to part with it if we beat him in a fight. Now, personally, I like knocking someone down a notch when they think they're so tough, and getting this unique Argent in the process as well is like killing two birds with one stone for me. And the grand battle between the two rank two undernauts is underway. And maybe the power of friendship between me and my teammates helped us win because Arahori stand alone and defeated when it was all over. He accepts the feat, gives us the unique Argent, and as well as the Mad King's grand plan. Arahori then takes off, and as we defeat him, we actually achieve the rank 1 Undernaught status, which is kind of befitting of what just happened. To summarize his grand plans, the Mad King foresaw his own potential death and set up a backup plan just in case. I'll go ahead and display the grand plans here if anybody wants to pause and read it, but to summarize, Plan A was basically the main part of the game where he tried to get a divine child of our world, us in that case, then use said child to receive the god's blessing to create his new world. And Plan B is to use the power of the treasure Yomi to become a god and create a new universe himself. He plans to absorb all the Argent and Yomi to get him to godhood. He's already prepared a device to make this happen and does not require the Divine Child for this plan. When I got back to base, Hajiji says that he's ashamed of Arahori for attacking him because he felt obligated to the Mad King. I talked to Hanba about my rank and he congratulates me on reaching rank 1, a feat that no one's ever done before. Yay. We give the unique Argent to Lucy and ask her to change the properties to allow six Undernauts to go out of Yomi and retain their powers for a day, rather than one Undernaut retaining their power for a week. She does her magic and we receive the Extreme Flower. She believes the Mad King is somewhere up high and she tells us that she wants to help us protect this world. We go to talk to Hanba and as we do, the radio tells us about 30 large monsters have appeared in Yomi Ward and causing chaos. And he also tells us that the Mad King is most likely at the top of the Yomi Court building and asks us to stop him. We head over to the gate and lock in our final choice of pursuing the Mad King, and what better way to pursue him other than to blast Namen Nayo. This game's music choice is like top notch. As we make it out, we see the city ablaze with dragon flyverns flying about, and we're attacked by one, but we make quick work of them. And we continue our run to the Yomi Court building. We finally reach the top. With a very nice view of the glowing blue Yomi structure, and we find this weird device attached to the top of the roof. The blue glow must be giving off some kind of Argent energy, so that's probably how the monsters are able to exist outside of Yomi for longer than normal, and just nearby, he shows himself. 
Director Kuzeto. He tells us of his plans to create a new god, but I tell him not on my watch. And the reason why the original Mad King refused to go with Plan B was because he was too prideful and hated the existence of the unified god, and how he wanted to achieve his goals without becoming a god himself. But unlike him, the new Mad King doesn't care and will do anything until his goals are realized. He turns on his device and calls to Yomi to give him Arjun. He then becomes... Over Soul, the new god of light and it was time to battle. He wants to use our death to ring in the new world, and we weren't gonna let that happen. The music was going off in this fight, and it really gave me the sense that this was the grand finale. And I used my same old strategy of basically using my strongest attacks, having my support support, and my tank defend. Sadly, the battle wasn't that hard and only lasted a few turns, but he was defeated. He asked for more Argent because this isn't enough power for him. He absorbs even more Argent than becomes... Over Hell, the new god of darkness. The music is once again a banger, but unfortunately the fight doesn't last that long either because I defeat him. He calls for more Argent and then a flash. He becomes Over Ardor, the new god of neutrality. This was it. This is the final fight for sure because this same song that's playing was the same song that played during the Mad King fight. It's becoming full circle now. His design, the music, and the sense of danger was all here. He went as far as calling himself Over Ardor as a way of thinking he was better than the original Ardor. And this music was just peak final boss music. He put up a good fight, but I played it carefully, and we ended up defeating him. And I do want to note here that I did a lot of grinding prior to these fights, so don't think these bosses were pushovers. Defeating him gives us 26k EXP. It's kind of low, but alright, whatever. He then calls for more Argent, and here comes Phase 4. No, I'm just kidding. He just blows up, and he's gone for good. We completed our final mission, and as a reward, we are given Peace in Yomi Ward. Hanba calls us up and acknowledges our victory. He's outside now with Cassandra and... And Lucy, with Lucy saying she senses no more Argent in the area. And just to clarify, she just means the Argent outside of Yomi, but the Argent inside is still very much present. And with the Argent outside of Yomi gone, all the monsters outside will slowly die off. Our main character is happy about the victory, but acknowledges that everyone involved knows a bit too much about what happened, and this won't end well for us. And he's right, a month later, after everything settled, a massive cover-up was already underway. The general public didn't even know about the monster attack that night. Yomi Corp is being questioned by Tokyo officials and the Japanese government. And without Kuzeto, the corporation did not have any way to resist all the pressure from the outside. Yomi Corp was put under government purview with a new government appointed director to replace Kuzeto. And even though Yomi Corp had to change, the importance of Argent hasn't. The world already heavily depended on Argent, so it's too inconvenient to stop using it. As soon as they could, the Yomi mining resumed. As for everyone involved with District 99, they weren't allowed to leave Yomi. The government couldn't afford to let people who knew of Yomi's dirty secrets live out in the open. And there were even talks of capital punishment to deal with all loose ends? Oh my god! But thanks to Cassandra's friends in America and the Soviet Union, we were able to keep our lives. Whew! under the condition to have freedom only inside Yomi. But we're allowed to go outside once a week with supervision, so that's not bad, I guess. And it's back to work with us. Cassandra actually prepared a promotion exam for us if we wanted to become a manager, so that's an option we can do. But before I get to that exam, let me talk to everyone else first. Hanba is not exactly thrilled with everything that's happened, but at least he can go home and see his family once a week and have his wife's cooking as well. It's bittersweet, but it leans more towards the sweet part, at least, thankfully. Lucy is relieved that the Mad King and his copies are gone for good. All of her clones and even Red Lucy can find some peace in that. And finally, Haijuji is helping Cassandra prep for the promotion exam, but in exchange he gets to learn more about the other world from her, so that's nice I guess. What a nerd. Now it's time to head over to the promotion exam and we're warped to a place that looks familiar. This is the same place where we fought the real Mad King in the base game. Cassandra appears, and she's ready to battle? There is a large concentration of Argent, so she's able to use her old powers again. 
And this is our final exam, a friendly battle with Cassandra, to the tune of Namen Nayo. And I really have to apologize here, guys. I screwed up my recording and forgot to capture my victory against her. But you can battle her once more to get some more rewards, and I'll show that in a bit right after. The first time you defeat her, you obtain the High Purity Argent. We go to take the Argent to Lucy, and we find her singing to herself. She thinks about all that's happened, and she's just happy to have met us. After all she's been through, it's really nice to see her happy after everything. We think to ourselves about everything that's happened and how the most rewarding thing was to see her smile, which I felt was the most appropriate choice to make. From Hajiji, we're given a document on Arahori, and you can read it here if you like. I spoke with Cassandra after our fight, and she tells us that she doesn't need to give us orders anymore, and we can work to our own discretion. And then she asks us how we found our night together, alone in a suite at a luxury hotel? And as you can see, I'm double-checking the chat log here because I thought I was going crazy and making stuff up. She says how we spent the night away drinking with a charming woman must have been a wonderful experience for us. Telling us we're cute and let us drink again sometime soon. A am I getting hot in here? Is it just me, or...? I hand over the High Purity Argent to Lucy, and that allows you to upgrade your equipment to level 99. Now, what is even there to do in the rest of this game, you may ask? Well, at this point, you can easily breeze through every enemy you can fight. However, you can choose to challenge yourself by fighting Cassandra again. But this time, she comes with two clones to help her. And this is no easy fight. She will rock you. She's basically the super boss of the game. And admittedly, I had to do a little bit of grinding and cheesing the fight with a few revival items. Items, but I managed to defeat her. If you manage to beat her, she'll give you stat boosting items as a reward. And with her defeated, that is the end of Undernaught's Labyrinth of Yomi. I beat the game at 57 hours and 48 minutes. My final thoughts on the game is that it nailed atmosphere so well. I had so much anxiety playing it when I was presented with a new area I wasn't familiar with. And the fear of whether something creepy would show up or a dangerous enemy always made me play things slowly and carefully. One of the downsides of the game is Undernaut's post-game, where the beginning half of it is just repetitive gameplay of fighting previous bosses, with only the mystery of the plot really pushing me forward to see what's happening next. And although I managed to summarize the story in one video, the parts in between the story like the actual gameplay are mostly padded by grinding and the exploration of the game. And this game will challenge you, like I had to redo some boss battles a few times because it was that tough. Of course you can grind less and make the game more challenging for yourself, but just know the game will not hold back. But everything else outside of gameplay, like the music, the art, is all just so fantastic. Special thank you to Hentai Check at GameFAQs and PixelMadness.com for being two sources that I use to help me get through certain parts of the game. And lastly, a heartfelt thank you to all my Patreon members. It's thanks to these guys' support that I can make these videos, and if you want to join my Patreon as well, you can join to come talk with me on my Discord. Thank you for watching, and I hope you guys have a good one.